Uh, welcome back, everybody. Got a special guest, new video. First, a disclaimer. Uh, nothing meant for legal purposes. We're talking about history for educational purposes and uh, all in the past, nothing current. But I'd like to introduce the twins. This is our second interview. How you guys doing? Hey, what's up? Good morning. Good morning. Going hard candles, man. Everybody knows them now. Uh, you guys had a show last night. You know, this topic's being covered, and, and the topic's going to be scatter breeding or scatter bread. And, uh, you know, you guys covered it. I had a post about it. I've talked about it before, and but it's coming up again. A lot of different venues, a lot of different groups, you know. And uh, I think it warrants, uh, you know, talking about it some more. Well, I this is twenty one, as you know. I had I had spoke on it because I had seen your post. I thought it was a very interesting conversation simply because I was watching the comments and I was watching your reply. And I was well, he's doing this on Facebook. Well, I think this would be a good one. To, you know, you always say we could share each other's, you know, ideals. So yes, sir. I thought, based on what you were doing and what you were trying to accomplish. Even now, to, you know, considering what I was reading, it was almost confusing to a lot of people because, you know, they couldn't really explain and see the understanding of the scatterbread part. Because you're right, all dogs are scatterbread at some point. And I like the way you, you addressed the tutor situation, you know, right. way back then when they was doing it. So I just thought it would be a good conversation to have and, and see how we did the poll, and our poll basically was showing some of the things. It wasn't a runaway poll, schoolboy. You know, I think it was 37% to 63%. 63% said um, yes, the no. dogs of the past is different. 37% said yes, the dogs are different. 63% said no, they weren't different. No, 37%. Gotcha. Yes, uh, 63% knows. Yeah. So that was a, just a strange thing about it because, again, I was looking for a blowout. You know, yeah. a lot, numbers would be a lot higher. So. Yeah. Mo took it from there. Go for a month. Well, I was calling for school for the whole show. I'm, <laughs> I've got to tell you, I was calling for him the whole show. I don't <laughs> yeah. know what to say yeah. because I went right after the boys' dogs with the four crosses. You know, you got the brand with the tree that Ronnie Boys is breeding was, and then you have the boys' dogs. The actual line itself consisted of four-way cross, right. which is, I consider that, why, how could you call that a, a scatterbrain? So that's saying like Jeep, yeah, boy, rascal, scattered bread dogs, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But then when we start looking into the the actual dogs that had these different lines in them, you know, champions and, and, and dogs that show relevance to me is what I'm interested in because those are prime examples of what we call traits that work. You know, whether it's the dudes or whatever, it always seems like when I told you guys to send some information in, they send them in nothing but champions. And, you know, they're trying to find some scattered bread champion out there. You know what I mean? Yep. And they, what we were coming up with, schoolboy, was they might be scattered bread, but the individual lines that were in these dogs were bred good. They weren't scattered bread. Exactly. They were actually formulas. Yep. So I'm like, I would not call that scattered bread. I don't know what, what what the definition and I say in school, when the professor put it out there, boy, and get your homework, you're going to be scratching your head, and then before you know it, you're going to be scratching your ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> <So> exactly. I, <laughs> yeah. I was I was calling for you last night. I, yeah. I, I said your name a couple of times. Yeah. I, I, you know, that this is for the professor. He set it up there, and, you know, there's a point to it, so I'm, I'm waiting on the point like everybody else. Yeah. I'm a student to that part. Right. Yeah, I felt bad, man, because I, I got the notification. I thought it was a good subject. Because, you know, like I said, it's popping off all around. I covered it. I'm glad you guys, you know, might come up with the idea to do that, you know. But I just got, I had some stuff to do. And then I thought, well, hell, I'll just have the twins on. We can talk about it on my thing. I'm always on your show, you know. I appreciate it mm -hmm. when you come on my show. 
and uh, we can just talk about it, you know. But scatter breeding mm -hmm. itself, it's kind of like scatter brain. And I've said this before, it's junk. It's shit. It has no formula, no no uh, rhyme to its reason, no, per, you know, it's, it's junk. But basically, it's, it's continuously outcrossing or continuously breeding dogs that are not related, right? So speaking... Regardless of the formula? What's that? Is that regardless of the formula uh, of... When you say scattered bread and, and breeding, going, study going out cards, yeah. there's really not a formula there. Then. Right. There's not a formula. Okay. It's just breeding whatever dogs you have to get. And here's here's the difference between multiple outcrosses or or uh, and, and scatter breeding, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, you could take dogs, particular dogs, that are bred a certain way. So, for instance, you could put, uh, let's say, Jeep. Red Boy, Rascal, uh, Jocko, Carver, right? People would look at that and go, well, that's scatter breeding, right? But when you get down to the to the nitty gritty, all it is is Dybo, Kobe breeding. Because wow. you have Jeep is Kobe, Carver. And the Carver stuff is Dybo, Kobe. Then you have the rascal, that's basically Eli, heavy Dybo, right? You have the, you have Jocko, uh, uh, which is uh, like uh, three-fifths Dybo. Then you have the red boy, which is Kobe, right? So you, 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 you put them all together, the names are all different. And anybody that doesn't know the history of the breed or how those particular dogs are bred, they're going to say, yeah, that's scatter breeding because of the names. And when people look at pedigrees, what happens is they don't recognize the dogs. They don't recognize the names of the dogs or the breeders, and they don't know the bloodlines. So to them, it's scatterbred because it, without looking, without seeing any, uh, commonality up close in the first four generations to them it's scatter breeding now it could be that could be junk it could be scatter breeding but when you see patterns put together like certain bloodlines that click or you see a particular dog and his relatives spread around in the pedigree it doesn't have to be heavy right it could be one dog could be uh let's say on one side of the ped, the dog is the sire. One particular dog is a sire. And go back three generations, he's also the great-great-grandsire on that one side. Right? Mm -hmm. On the bottom, he could be the grandfather and the great-grandfather. So in a six or seven generation pedigree, that particular dog might only be in there four times. But that's what the breeder is keen on. That dog. So as long as his influence is in there and you're using dogs that represent that particular dog that have his traits and pass them on, your bloodline is that dog or that particular breeding you make is that dog. All those crosses and all that other stuff in there is just to get you to the next point. You're not keen on that stuff. You're keen on that one dog. And you can do the same with particular bloodlines. Or like... A lot of people do. You breed bloodlines together that click. Just like Jeep, Red Boy, Rascal, Jocko, Carver. They, they, they not related up close, but they come from the same stuff. And like I said, it's basically with some other stuff in there. Maybe some Leitner, Corvino or whatever. But it's basically Dybo, Kobe. That's, that's the vast majority of that breeding. Right. Right. But when you have people that, that, you know, and you can, you know, like you said, talking about the past, Tudor, Kobe, Heinz, Leitner, I don't care who it is. They all got different dogs, several different dogs from different breeders. Right. Acquired these dogs, tested them out, mashed them, bred the ones that survive or bred the best ones. Right? Kept those and then started breeding those dogs together. 
And here's where it gets away from scatter breeding because you could say, okay, when everybody starts, it's all scatter bred. You're getting different stuff. You have to do that to, to first build a foundation and then to make a family of dogs. So once they get through running through all the dogs and they breed what they have to left together, it still may be a bunch of crosses. But you're going to take that and the pups off of those and the grandchildren off. You're going to breed them all together. So within two or three generations, all the dogs are related, either tight or loose, inbred, cross, line bred, whatever. They're all related. That's how you make a family of dogs. That's the difference between someone who just continuously breeding shit and, or crosses and, and uh, someone who is developing a family of dogs. Because like in some of the peds you were showing, you know, there's some relation there. Or it's a cross that someone made that worked before, so they're just repeating it. But at some point, regardless of how many crosses you start with or how many outcrosses you make, or even if you make outcrosses in the future, the difference between scatter breeding and not is you breed the individuals you have together so that they're all related in some form or fashion. And that, that's, that's the difference between just breeding shit and junk, scatter breeding, and creating a family of dogs. And, and uh, you know, they, the dogs don't even have to be real tight. You know, I'm against too much inbreeding. That's, that's the best way to mess up your dogs. Too much inbreeding. But too much outcrossing, repeated outcrossing, where there's no commonality, there's no formula, there's no nothing related except way back. That that'll mess up your stuff too, because because the gene pool is so wide. What are you keen on, you know? Right. So you know, it, it just it just it, it came up because of that, you know. Like people, you know, all oh, that scatterbred, that scatterbred, that's and a lot of the pedigrees I was looking at. No, it's not. It's not scatterbred. You just don't understand that those individuals are related. You just don't see it because you're not going farther back enough in the ped or you don't know the particular breeders or the bloodlines that, that they came from, you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay, now, last night's show, Schoolboy, if you watched it, I think Mo was, you know, when Mo goes in the pedigrees, you see he always starts and he goes back because he, he's, he's always looking for the formula. But last night we were, he was more in keen to uh, trying to show basically what you were saying in your posts on Facebook than what you're basically saying now. The thing is, we stuck more to the match dog part of the commonality because Anything other than the match dogs aren't really relevant to us. Did it seem like he was getting that point across to where it fit into what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, because <clears throat> here's the thing, too, even going back to the past. Cause let's, let's go back to the beginning. It's an unknown, 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 un all this unknown. So why, why were they acquiring these dogs, and why did they breed them together? They did it based on their performance. That, that's it. And and also, you go way back, there wasn't that many breeders. There wasn't that many people actually importing dogs. So, so once they acquired the dogs, whoever got them from wherever they got them, whether they imported them or got them from dogs that were here, it's like Kobe. He had Irish dogs, and people think he imported Irish dogs. He didn't import Irish dogs. He got the Irish dogs that were already imported here right that that's basically how that and that happened with a lot of people but you go to them imported dogs there's no pedigree on them it's all unknown 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 so just by virtue of the fact that that hey they don't know how the dogs are bred they're just looking at the dogs themselves they got to see them match they got to see them competed with right and those are the dogs they went to to breed with. And that, that's standard or should be standard with any sporting or working animal. You have to base it on its performance, whether it's a racehorse or a game fowl or a hunting dog, right? And, right. and 
when you do it like that, you're not too concerned about how it's bred. Because if you're going to become a breeder, it doesn't really matter how they're bred as long as the performance is there. Because when you get them, you're going to breed all of them together. And at some point, they're going to become related anyways. So the unknown to them, it didn't, it didn't really matter. They knew it came from what's his name in Ireland, Kilkenny, where it was from, or they knew it was from the dude that was a breeder in Staffordshire or London or wherever it was from. They knew it came from that guy, even though they didn't know it's off of this dog, that dog, this dog, that dog. They know he's a known breeder. He breeds good dogs. We're going to get his dogs. I'm going to match them. And once they prove themselves, I'm going to take the best ones, breed them together. And make a family of dogs. And that 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 can be standard at any point in history. Right? You can't get so right. hung up on the pedigrees to say, wow, look how this dog is bred. That, that don't matter to me. It only matters if the dog is a good one. If the dog's a good dog, represents his family and himself, and he's got all these traits that I like, that's when the pedi yeah. pedigree matters. I'm sorry. But the, the, the whole basis of breeding and having the breed was for competition, for sport. So naturally, they have to be, you know, uh, uh, dogs that were matched or competed with, you know. And there's some people, I only breed to champions and grand champion, this and that, proven dog winners and all that. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, thank you, sir. Sorry. Yeah, I might. Yeah. Okay, you gotta go on mute. <laughs> okay. No, I was at the post office. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. That's all right. That's all right. So that that's that's my thing. Regardless of how your dogs are bred, when you start putting them together, at some point they're going to be related. Now, it it would behoove you to to get dogs from someone who is known to produce good ones. And dogs that were competed with. I'm speaking of the past, of course. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you're going to acquire dogs that you know from past experience. Whether you know the history of the breed or your own experience or someone else who had dogs before you. You know these two bloodlines work together good. Like Red Boy Jocko. Right. Like Jeep Red Boy. Like Jeep Rascal. Or Eli Carver. Or Leitner Colby. Or whatever it is. Right? That just helps you increase your odds of of uh you know your chances of getting good dogs because they have proven and all the these ones that i'm talking about most of them where, where you see uh what they go back to it's you know it's uh it's english and irish dogs you know something i've talked about repeatedly because that's the that's the foundation of the breed you know okay now, I was on that talking uh, in traits <clears throat> because what I was noticing the traits. Why are they doing these moves? I'm looking at them like they're trying to bring traits, move traits forward. Yeah. Like you were saying, um, you might have one on the top side, the, the, the uh, grandfather might be the great grandfather. <clears throat> that, as you go back, you start seeing him two and three times in these generations. Right. I look at that like they're trying to keep that trait. They're moving that trait. They're trying to hold on to that trait. Yep. They're taking that trait and they're adding it to another trait that they like. Because in a lot of those winners, I kept running across a formula. Not no whole bunch of dogs that we put together came up with this dog. Right. We could not find it. Not one of those dogs. And they were the champions. They had a few one time when they but there was a majority of champions. Every single one of those dogs. Right. They look at them, they look scattered bare. But when I started going back, I said, you could tell they're breeding traits. Yep. They're trying to move traits. Yep. Because they would have like a, a grandfather here on the top, but a great great grandfather, that's the same dog on the bottom. Yep. You 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 know that that should be first and foremost, you know. And, and I kind of look at it like, let's say we didn't know the pedigrees of our dogs. The dog didn't have no pedigrees, right? We don't know how they're bred. 
All you have left to go on is their behavior, temperament, athleticism, ability, all the stuff that we look for when we, you know, are judging our dogs. We're judging them on their traits. So can you breed dogs like that? Yeah. All you do is flip it around. Instead of looking at the pedigree, you look at the individual dogs themselves and breed according to that. And the pedigree will just follow after that. Because if you if you want a particular type of dog, of your family of dog is known for these things, right? It could be speed, strength, stifle, fighting, head fight, whatever it is, right? Deep mm -hmm. chest, all this stuff. Those are the ones you breed. That's how you get it, right? So regardless of how the dog is bred, and that's why you see some that have there are three, four, five, even six-way crosses, right? They're not breeding yep. particularly so much on the blood. They're breeding on the dogs themselves. And when you have an individual, like you said, as long as you put him on, he's on, or her is on both sides of the pedigree, right? And you follow the individuals that represent that dog, the ones that have those traits and are able to pass it on, He's going to be the dominant factor in your family of dogs. And even like, like Boyles, you know, this came up in my group, you know, and, and Daibo did too. What made Daibo? What, 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 what was the, the commonality, the main thing in Daibo? It's Hubbard's Gimp. He's on the top side a couple of times, and he's way down on the bottom side, like an eighth or a sixteenth. That's enough so that Gimp's influence is what made Daibo. Regardless of what the other dogs in the pedigree are. They're good dogs and you need them, right? But the concentration is on Gimp. Gimp. So with Boils, it's easy because it's it's up close. We can see it. It's Dirty Mary. Every Everything that came from his yard, even the, the Bobby Jr. to Reddy that made uh, Queen of Hearts, right? That's not related to Dirty Mary, except a little bit. They she has a little she has a little bit of bolio in her, right? right? But where that is valid is they took that stuff, bred her, bred Queen of Hearts to Mister Rogers. There's your Dirty Mary again. So yeah. all the stuff coming from him, and at some point when he's making his breedings, has Dirty Mary in it, whether it's half brother, half sister, aunt, uncle, cousins, whatever it is. And all she did was take Dirty Mary and bred her, bred her. To four or five different males and then took the offspring of those just like i was saying before took the offspring of those and put them together so you have you have eli you have bully son you have uh boomerang as the crosses you have art right you have all these yep. different males bred differently but they all keyed on they're all keyed on Dirty Mary. She's the common denominator in everything, right? Yes, sir. So you can do that with, with any dog or any bloodline if you want, you know? But when people yeah, say... We did a lot, a lot of that last night. We seen that last night. Yeah. While you're speaking on that particular piece right there, we saw that last night. We, we were pulling up these pedigrees, and what you're saying is definitely a fact because we were running into that. What we were seeing on the top side was so strong up close. And then you look at the bottom, you don't see no relation. When we started going back, the very same dogs was down there on the bottom. Right. And yeah. You, and they were in there. And, and that was, I was like, you know, we've seen it a lot in a lot of those winners. And I was that was a good point that you brought that up because, see, it, that had me confused again. Right. Okay, because that's not scattered it it's looks not like it from the look of it, but yeah. it's not scattered. Yeah. It's the names that confuse you, you know, it, it, it confuse people. Yeah. You know, I don't know who that is. Well, who's I never heard of that. Well, it, it could be a litter mate to something that's on the top. You just are not familiar with that litter mate. Right. Mm -hmm. It could be it could be like if you were to see Dirty Mary and, and Boyles didn't do that. But if you see at some point he incorporated Angel Face. Right. You go, well, what, what's Angel yep. Face? That's her sister. Right now, he didn't do that with right. Dirty Mary and Angel Fate, but he did it with offspring, later offspring. 
So you have, you have, uh, you know, offspring of all the males that he bred Dirty Mary to. He was breeding them together. And other people did the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and so no matter what, what, uh, what pedigree you're looking at, right? If it's mostly boils breeding, you're going to see all the males that, that he bred her to, but she's going to be the foundation of every one of them on down the right. line, including, including the crosses that you put in there. Because if you're going to, if you're going to add a cross, let's say you're making a total outcross 50, 50. Now, what are you going to do after that? You're either going to inbreed it brother, sister, or father, daughter, mother, son, or you're going to take the offspring from that and breed it to one side or the other or both sides, right? That's that's the whole purpose of making of outcrosses to put fresh blood in there, get superior athletes. But then what are you going to do with those athletes after they you produced them? You got to breed them some way, right? Which is different from just right. crossing, 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 get this blood, that blood. I'm putting all this crap together. There's no there's no way for the genetics to tighten up and key on anything because there's so much involved. That's scatter breeding. It's just, that's why I mean it's junk. You, you're messing up your whole bloodline. Like what are you keying on? Like like where's your where's your where's your uh, train of thought? You know what traits are you are you uh, you know focusing on? Right. So a lot of some of the pedigrees you were you're putting up once you go back you say hey the, okay these dogs they are related okay they, they're related family related or they're particular bloodlines that are related it's like that's what they did with bully son right so you have bully son bred to daughters of eli jr that's his brother so you know they're they're related even though they're not both off a of bully son you know he's being bred to his nieces like that, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with mm -hmm. the Nigarino blood. If you take it to the carver or you take it wherever you take it, Stampinato or whatever, there's commonality because <clears throat> Nigarino is basically Eli Jr. based. So wherever you go with it, you could take Nigarino. That's why it works good with Chinamen, right? Because they're basically mm -hmm. kind of cousins like or distant cousins. So it's going to work. So as long as you have a formula to go with something, something you're trying to produce, then then it's not scatter breeding, right? And you showed that in, in several of the pets. So I encourage people that are watching this, if you didn't watch it, go to uh, Twin GHK Re Reloaded, you know, Going Hard Kennels Reloaded, and uh, it'll be, the top little topic will be scatter breeding. Watch that show, and then, uh, and then you'll kind it'll kind of, get into what we're talking about here so i'm glad you guys you guys did that we definitely put it mike definitely said uh, uh big bro you know we kind of i told your content because it was such a good content <laughs> yeah no i i encourage people to do that i do that too you know if i pick something just like i did you know with this one i said well mm -hmm. heck i didn't get to go on the show i'll just i'll just call them up see if they want to do a little interview about it you know and and uh I'm glad you said yes. So, you know, we always helping each other out, man. I just, right, I just, right. uh, but it's, it's confusing to a lot of people because first and foremost, what they do is they look at it. If they don't understand it or not familiar with it, they're going to say, oh, that's scatterbred. That's not necessarily true. That's why you have to know the history of the breed and particular dogs. And there's ways to, you can breed almost every different kind of way. But like you said, and you always reiterate, there has to be some formula to it. If right. there's not, you know, you could even breed dogs just say on particular traits. Let's say, speaking about the past, I like chest dogs. That's all I'm breeding is chest dogs. If they don't hit the chest, I'm not breeding them no matter what. Well, if you do that, you can take a dog that's bred, don't matter how it's bred, as long as it has that trait and you put these dogs together that all have that trait or for the most part have that trait, guess what? You're gonna get a bunch of chest dogs. That's 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 just that's just the way genetics work and nature works and all that. And my my advice, like let's say you're making an outcross, you know, most people in their mind, because of what they've been taught, you know, they think, well, 
I'm going to I'm going to make an outcross because I'm lacking something, you know, or I'm going to breed to something that's going to enhance my blood, something I don't have in my blood, in my dogs. That's fine. That's perfect. But I preferred to outcross to dogs that had the same traits as my dogs because there's a better chance that because the dogs are not related, but they share the same traits that I'm going to get those traits. So that's how I looked at outcrossing dogs. It wasn't so much the blood, or that's how I learned anyways. I didn't start off that way, but I learned that that worked better. If I'm going to make an outcross, I'm going to try to get something that performs the same way as my stuff does. And that way it'll be enhanced. There's more of a chance that you're going to get it. And then that was another point I made when it came to Brad and our line of dogs. You know, they were stifled dogs. And I was telling you, well, you know, there were some Yellow John dogs out there. I think one of them was named Basco. You know, he was a back-end dog. He bred just like our Amber dog was bred. And, you know, and she was a stifle dog when she could get back there. You know what I mean? Yep. So when we bred the Ace, you know, it, that was strictly a, a stifle dog. I mean, she had all the tricks and right. the moves to get back there and know how to lay in there and destroy it. Because her mother was a stifled dog. Right. And he was like, did they pull that trait? In, and for it to be so strong, I mean, most other going hard dogs, 95% of the going hard dogs were really stifled backhand dogs. Right. You know, they won a lot of their matches breaking down stifles. Yep. Yep. Because that, <laughs> what that does is it, it you know, those, the ace is not related to the female, right? Nope. Right. But they share the same traits. So when you put them together, right. you know, the 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 that it trait came out, trait. right? So it was locked in, right? Yeah. Now if mm -hmm. if they hadn't come out like that, then you, you okay, uh, it's lacking that trait somewhere along the line. But because that trait came out, now it's locked in in the gene pool. So from that point on, whatever you whatever breedings you make, whichever dogs you breed to. As long as that dog has that stifle trait, it's going to keep going. Because right. the trait itself is locked in. Not so much the bloodline or, you know, uh, uh, you know the, what a dog is known for or whatever. The trait itself, that particular trait, stifle, is locked in your blood. And it, it proved that by putting those two together, that's what you got. So that's the proof yeah. right there. Once that's done, when you take those dogs and breed them here and there and whatever, right? All you do is yep. follow the ones that have the stifle trait because you're going to have some that don't, right? Don't right. breed. If you want to keep that stifle trait, don't breed to those. Breed the ones that have that if that's what you're looking for. But it's mm -hmm. it's almost set in stone, right? And that's all right. the, the guys way in the past, that's all they did. They They really weren't looking at pedigrees. There wasn't a science to it for them. It was just breeding to the dogs that they saw, that they liked, that had traits, that they saw win or they saw, saw show gameness or whatever it was, and go breed to them. It, it was done more that way than, you know, than, uh, you know, oh, I want to put Feely and, and Lightner together. I'm going to put Colby with this and that. No. Colby was known to have good dogs. People saw him. People got them. They bred them. You know, famous dogs, Kager and Pincher and all that. So they wanted some of that blood. Mm -hmm. And the same thing. They saw a Corvino dog. Oh, he's game this and I'm going to get some of that. So when you look at the Peds, yeah, it's got everything. You know, if you look at Dybul, he's got Williams and Armitage and Hemphill and the, the, all kinds of stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. That's that's how mm -hmm. you start. And then when you get them, like I said, you put them together. Well, now we look at Dybul, the end result. What is he? He's a Hubbard's Gimp dog, basically. It's that simple. Okay. Right. Right? What's a Boyle's dog? It's a dirty Mary dog, basically. You know? What's a, what's a, mm -hmm. you know? What's a Bolio dog? It's Zeke Black Widow, basically. That That's all it is. It's got a little bit of other stuff here and there. But, but, uh, it's basically those same dogs. And that's what you try and do when you breed. You try and key on certain dogs that have certain traits that you like. And, and you don't see that no more. That's why a lot of people, they're saying there's a lot of scatter breeding, you know. 
you don't get no family traits. You, you can get litters nowadays and all the pups look different and they're all marked different and they're all, you know, act different. That's why people say, you know, well, each dog is individual and they're their own. Well, why? Because they're, they're, they're the way that they're breeding them. They're not locking in any traits. You know, my, mine in the back in the day, people used to go, oh, that's a schoolboy dog. They come to my yard, Richard, all your dogs look the same. And it didn't matter whether they were line bred, inbred, outcross, loose, whatever. Because I follow particular traits. And along with that came particular structure and particular colors and all that. And, you know, 30. Yeah, that's, a, that's one of those. Is that one like, one, like the old family red note? <clears throat> Got Wilder, Serona, Red Devil, you know, those dogs. Yep. Um, so when those people are breeding those dogs and you see all those dogs in that one pedigree and the dogs are still coming out red, would that be scattered breeding or is that still in the, in the uh, makeup of what we're talking about? That's in the makeup of what we're talking about because if the, if you're talking like strictly old family red nose, most of the current ones came through Hemphill, some from Wallace, a little bit from uh, uh, Burt Klaus, you know, like that. But they go back to the same stuff. So the current ones, you know, Serona, Wilder, Geronimo, all that Cappy Ross stuff. Yeah. Or you know, yeah, they all come from from basically the same uh, dogs. You know, just different people had it, same blood, different people had, and, and and in all of them, you'll see, regardless of what it is, you'll see uh, that um, Ferguson centipede, right? You'll see him littered yes. all through that stuff because he was such a prominent stud back in the day, right? Right. So they all kind of, of go back to the same stuff, you know, which basically goes back to the Irish dogs, you know, Leitner and Feely and Corcoran, stuff like that. It's just that right. they, they, you know, they started coming out red, red nose. So the Irish dogs were called old family dogs because they were from the old country. And then when they started coming out red, red nose, which I guess was, was a product of inbreeding, right? And then that recessive trait becomes dominant. So when you start breeding them, a lot of them come out red, red nose. That's the old family. Oh, red I say a lot of them too. Yeah. yeah, I met a young lady. She had a yard, and I looked at her pedigree, and I think I went down to thirty-two <laughs> generations <laughs> back. You know, as far as I could go back into that thing. You know, and you notice that. You know, I always went. I said, I'm going this far back. That all these dogs are red nose dogs. Yeah. Every single one of them. Yeah. So that, that I just saw that so interesting. My thing is, when when you're making them breeding like that, and you got so many generations of this, and you're still able to keep the red, what but what else is it? You, you see what I'm saying? You, you, I can see you're maintaining the red, but what else comes with the red? <laughs> you know what I mean? When, when it comes to pit bulls, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're gonna okay. we're gonna we're gonna piss a lot of people off because. In that respect, that's all they were breeding for. They want red, red nose, right? Okay. And when mm -hmm. and when you do that, it's like like uh, like a show standard. If you have a show standard that says the dogs have to look this way and built this way, and you know the stifle so uh, many inches and the pastern so long and the chest, all this stuff, the dogs all start becoming to look the same, right? So you're not breeding on the performance of the dog. You're not breeding on what it can do. You're breeding on how it's supposed to look. And that's what happened, I think, with a lot of the red, red-nosed dogs, old family dogs. They're breeding them for their particular looks, but they're negating all the performance, all the athleticism, all that. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of them. Even in my day, I saw some, right, competed with, and they were good ones. A handful out of all the, you know, and, and the red, red nose, you know, we got to give credit to Stratton. He made those popular because he wrote a book and they were in the book, right? 
just like going like Barney. He was in the book. And, and you know, Grand Champion Hank and like that. And in Barney's case, there weren't a lot of Barney's dog. The guy kept most of his dog. He didn't really put him out there. So you couldn't really go get a lot of going like Barney. But it was just the fact that they were ever, they were talked about in a book. It's what made them popular. And that's what made the resurgence of red, red nose dogs popular because they came out in Stratton books. They were unique. People liked the way they look and they started getting them. And then started breeding the shit out of them because of how they look. You know, gold eyes, gold, you know, uh, uh, gold toenails, you know, red nose, red fur, all that stuff. And the performance was put in the back burner and they lost a lot of the traits. And that's what happens with the, with a lot of bloodlines, you know. Just like I said, you can, you can screw it up by scatter breeding, outcrossing, continuous outcrossing. Well, you can screw it up by continuous inbreeding too. So to get a family of dogs, you know, one of the fastest ways to get them to look the same and act the same and all that is to inbreed them. But if you don't have performance behind it, you're just breeding on looks and you're going to lose a lot of the good traits. So you're right. Like, what were they, what else were they breeding for? Not, not much, <laughs> you know. Right, right. I mean, these puppies were definitely, like, I was surprised because these puppies, they looked so pretty, they were active, they was sharp, you know, had a, had a drive, you know, that hunt drive. Yeah. Wild little puppies. And I'm, I'm, I'm impressed because they were open and red nose, so now I'm going to go investigate the pedigree. And it was just surprising how far back. You know, she said she had all those dogs in her pedigree. She damn near got every single red nose yeah. family of dogs in that pedigree. Yeah. I mean, every single one. Fergus and Sinope was in there a lot. I mean, yeah. Water was in there a lot. Geronimo. Yeah, and... was in there a lot. Geronimo. Yeah. Yeah, I'd seen them. I was like, now, those puppies, dudes, I don't see a match dog in there nowhere, but yet those little puppies. Had you know all the qualities of you know the kind of shit that you want to see are the good dogs, and I just wanted to know is the possibility of all those dogs still being able to maintain the red with no room that I could find. And, you know, when I'm I'm looking at pit bulls and not every breed, I'm focusing on the pit bull and what we what is the normal standard. Not from the now time, but from our time. Right. You know, it was performance. Major factor. And in those crosses, without them being performers, the dogs that were real red nose back then, they were performers. Am I correct? Yep, they were. Yep, they sure were. And and so, like I said, that's what that's what any breed is based off of performance or work, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, that should be first and foremost. When you don't have that, you lose it. And, and, you know, the old family red nose, they were real popular for good reason. A lot of people competed with them, you know, but when you get yeah. away from that, now you lose it. It's just like gameness. If you get away from gameness, it's lost real fast. Because the first instinct of most animals is survival. So we take that instinct out, but it's still in the back burner there, right? So if you don't continue with proven game dogs, it's lost real quick. Because that instinct for survival will kick in. So any performance, any great bloodline back in the day, if it's not kept up, it's going to be lost. Even though the dogs may look like they're supposed to. And they may have a lot of the same behaviors, temperaments and behaviors, right? It's that mm -hmm. performance that that matters most, you know. I mean, a, a thoroughbred ain't much good for, for racing, you know. The culls or the old ones are what they actually use for police departments like in San Francisco, right? It's not the ones that were top winners and racers like that. You know, they just found another venue for them horses to be used so you see a lot of thoroughbred race horses being used by the police department in san francisco right but the good ones they ain't right. used for that they they couldn't because they're too high strung 
and too unmanageable by just a regular person, right? Right. So that's how fast traits can be lost or ruined, you know, through heavy inbreeding. But, you know, uh, that that's one of the reasons I encourage people. Get out there and do something with your dog. Exercise them all the time. Take them out. Run them. Do weight pulls, man. Do treadmill race. I don't care. Hunt hogs with them. Do something. So at least their physical traits won't be lost. And the physical has a lot to do with the mental stuff. So that they just work together, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, did very you, interesting. Yeah. Did you get any... Uh, what kind of responses did you get in the chat or comments or do you remember? They were, like I said, they were throwing me pedigrees. And the pedigrees they were throwing me because I'm looking for some scatterbred stuff. Let's see if we can find some scatterbred dogs. But when they were sending them in, and you know, they were sending in performing dogs, because that's what I call relevant. They right. were talking about. So as we look at it from the front. It looks like it's scattered. Right. But when I start clicking, you know, you start seeing, okay, now we're seeing stuff that we recognize. And now we're starting to see stuff that's way up there in the front. We way back here on the bottom of this one female. We back here around six or seven. We seeing a dog that was on the top in the third. There you you didn't even see by looking at it. You see that dog one time on the first pole. Get back there in the eight. You got one, the same dog back there in the seven on the bottom. So I said, see, but see, this is not scatterbred because I picked up a formula in every single dog they sent in. Because then their minds, they're sending scatterbred dogs at once. You see what I'm saying? Yep. They're not looking far enough back to when I go looking back, I find formulas. And if there's a formula, there's a purpose. Right. That's not scattering. Yeah. yeah. Am I correct? You're correct. And, you know, I've said this before, too. A lot of times the people, they're making these breedings and they're successful, right? They don't know what's mm-hmm. behind their dog. They're not, they're not familiar with the dogs that are behind their dogs. But the reason they're familiar is because even though they don't realize it, they're repeating what was done beforehand. So that dog that's in the past, whether it was done consciously or not, they reintroduced them in future breeding and, you know, maintain that level of performance, right? Because when you look at it like that, now you're going to have not just that dog up front and way back there, but... The dogs in between those two points are related. Yes, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, because they're lying beating by the time that they got up there to the front when we started out in the first four generations. Yeah, those are basically lying red dogs. Exactly, exactly. It's you know some some you know dogs like Zebo for instance. You know he does, uh, that blood doesn't okay. do any good Talk inbred. About Zebo. It, it doesn't do any good inbred, right? But you can inbreed, you can line breed them, like uh, you know, champion abuelita, right? She's off a zebo, and then her mama, on the bottom side, either the mama or the grandmother is off a zebo too. So abuelita is a line bred zebo dog, right? Right. That that's how effective zebo is like that. But when you inbreed them, you know, like Lonzo and some people did, you know. They start becoming short on air and don't have this and that. And, you know, it, it messes them up, which you don't have to inbreed. People think you have to inbreed to lock in traits. You don't. You you, you can do it by, you know, what we've been talking about here. Or, <clears throat> you know, you can do it through loose, even loose line breeding, you know. And some dogs take to inbreeding better, like red boy stuff. You can inbreed the shit out of it. It still comes out pretty good, you know. It's just a matter of finding out which ones. But because you're loose line breeding or, you know, you're you too, you know, you have crosses here and there. That doesn't mean you have to lose traits as long as you keep using the individuals that exhibit those traits. And, uh, you know, that that pedigree, like the one you were talking about, they had to have seen something in the dogs they were breeding.
to make them want to breed that way, you know. Right. And uh, and I would guess it's because they saw, you know, they they remembered something from the past, or they you know they have an experience from the past, and they see it in the current dogs that they're using now, and go, I'm gonna breed to that dog. I'm gonna breed that, you know. And and right. you know, right, it's, right back. To yeah, back, right back, back to, to it. Front. Yeah, right back to the front. You can do that with you now, know. Why we on? Go ahead, bud. No, go ahead. Why we on Zebo? Why yeah. we on Zebo? Okay, now Zebo is a black dog. Right. And and but he had Vindicator and Rosie were chocolate dogs. Yep. Okay, so why did Zebo ever throw a chocolate dog? Well, chocolate itself, just like uh, uh, um you know black and tan or brown or something you know it's it's a derivative of black right okay. so so because the the you know vindicator and and ruby or rosy because they're that color when they're bred that color could dominate right right zebo has the that in him but because he's black, the black is going to dominate, right? Okay. But I would right. suggest, guess, anyways, if you were to inbreed Zebo, you're either going to get all black dogs or you could get that chocolate or even the red, red nose. That could come out. Okay. You, know, you might get one. I'll, I'll put it this way. I have a friend. He bred... Uh, uh, the male he used was... Heavy Andy Zebo, you know, some Lonzo, Steve, Ozzy Stevens stuff. But it's all that kind of same blood, right? Right. And he has a real heavy uh, Eli bred female, right? Mm -hmm. He bred those two together. The whole litter was black, except for one pup came out red, red nose. That influence is, wow. is so far back that you think, well, the black's going to dominate. It did, except for that one little bitch. She's red, red nose, just like Vindicator and Rosie back then, because her mm -hmm. sire is tight bred on that stuff. So I know where it's okay. coming from. He knows where it's coming from. And and that's why it came out that way. So that that can happen, too, you know. For me, when I see something like that, for me, that's that's an indicator. That is an outcross within my own dogs. So I can use that little red, red nose bitch. I don't have to go outside of my family. I can breed her down the line, and that's my cross. That's my Zebo, Lonzo, Ozzy Steen, whatever you want to call it, cross. That's the way she can be used. Even if you breed her to her uncle, cousin, daddy, mama, that, that is an outcross within the blood. And there's a term for it. I forgot. You can Google it and all that. But that pattern comes up like that every once in a while. Okay, so under the same circumstances, why didn't Honey Bunch ever throw black dogs? Well, she did when she was bred to a black male, you know? Yeah, only yeah. when she was bred to a black male. Yeah. You, you and see I'm, what I'm saying, though? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like like to Bo, let me think. Nope, there's none. Well, that could be because... Uh, that bottom side of her is so heavy, the Carver, the Iron Head, the Kobe Lightner, right. right? That that's dominant within her, right? Or it could be right. that she's not off a of bully son. <laughs> you know, hey, I don't know. I, okay. Yeah. Because but the thing, the thing is too, is people, you. you know, they get it in their head, this too, and it's, it's, sometimes they're correct, sometimes they ain't. But they'll look at a dog and it doesn't look like, you know, it it looks like the mama, but like like Honey Bunch. She looks like the mama. She don't look nothing like Bully Son. And they'll go, well, right. she's she's not right. off a of Bully Son, right? That does not necessarily true. It could be true, but just because she looks like her mama and not her daddy, then you know that that doesn't make make it that that Bully Son isn't her sire. But it could be right also. It's just I kind of want to throw in there because people go, well, he don't look like his daddy. Well, shit, maybe he looks like his mama. 
Maybe he looks like his grandpa or great grandpa. We're always talking about throwbacks, just like that little red, red nosed female I'm telling you about. Her that color, that trait, that look goes back seven generations in that guy's pit. That's how far back it is. But yet it came up. So right. We had chocolate dog. We had one chocolate dog in our breeding when we bred to um when we across that bruiser stuff into the native stuff. Yeah. And every once in a while, I mean, even in the, the dogs that still got going hard dogs in them, they are popping up with this chocolate stuff. Right. You know, and it just was surprising to me because I was wondering where the chocolate come from. Yeah. And I, I had a comment that came in um, where Zebo had the ability to was throwing red nosed dog. Um, and they say uh, Zebo has old family red in his back. But he never threw a black dog. That's what I told him last night. But I've um, never seen the uh, Ferguson centipede. Right. Yeah, but he never threw a black dog. That's the thing. You mean he, he never right. threw a red dog? I mean, yeah, he never threw a red dog. Zebo yeah. never threw a red dog. Yeah. He threw, uh, it was in him because um, he has, they say Zebo had some old family red. In him. Right. It's right. obvious when his sister and his brother were red. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, how about, I can't Zeebo remember. All litter mates. Yeah. Ch Champion Ruby, what was she? Okay, I think she's off of Zebo. Yeah, and Hydro. Okay. He was talking about him last night. He was a red dog. Yeah. Uh, and he was yeah. a Zebo dog. Yeah. Hydro was. Yeah. I mean, I could. But he I had could... red in his pedigree, yeah. Mike. Remember, I showed you what he There was red in his pedigree on the bottom. Yeah. And remember, I said that, but he wasn't directly off of Zebo either. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. See, that was my, but that was my yeah. point. I've right. never seen a dog directly, you yeah. know. And I'm gonna tell you, Flint Rocker made a, a remark, and he tried to say Zebo was off of Black Shine. Right. Yeah, we've talked about you know, that too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you yeah. know, that's what it brought me around to. Well, that is kind of odd that he never do a chocolate dog like his brother and his sister. And you know. And I really did try to find one, but I yeah. said it has to be directly off. But then remember, Super Nat, when he had Grand Champion Ace and those breedings and rambling them, they was chocolate. Right. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I didn't, did not, you know, so it, that threw me off too. Yeah. Because yeah, I go back and I look and I say, well, Charlie was red and white. Okay. So, but to have an all chocolate dog, that was odd because where is his pedigree is that chocolate stuff come, just right. red dog coming from. Yeah. Down. Yeah, and yeah, like I, I said, at the bottom, spider. Right. Townsley spider. Right. Is there any red in them? Well, there's red brindle. Yep, yeah, it sure is. Yeah, that's right. I, there's red brindle. So, and that's what I'm saying, like the little female I I just mentioned, you know. That red, red nose that stuff, that's seven generations ago. And he bred two black dogs together, the sire's black, the mama's black. And it's an outcross, right? But here you have this little red, red female. So at the same time, something from way back like that, red, red nose, can come out in this one little female. The same thing can happen where you breed Zebo and he don't throw no red dogs. Right. It, it's just, you know, it, it, I'm not a geneticist, but I know... Basically, if it's in there, it can come out at at any time, and uh, or or depending on how you mix the colors of the dogs, you can get this color, right? Because like take black for instance, black is you can make black by mixing yellow, you know, purple and green or something, you know, not even dark colors, and you mix them together, and that. That produces black, black paint or whatever. So, brindle and and these off colors, you know, they, it it's a it depends on how the colors are mixed within the dogs themselves for it to come out like that. The only thing I would say is that 
when you have an anomaly like that, regardless of how you breed forward, it's going to pop up every once in a while. Like that little red, red nose female. Or like you're saying, the chocolate stuff in your dogs. It doesn't particularly have to be a chocolate colored dog in the background, but it could be the mix of color, like, like let's say black and red and buckskin. Maybe that's what makes chocolate. I don't know, but it could be that combination like that. Right. Hey, Mo, uh, now you was, um, when y'all talk about that, I remember we used to, when we was Mo was breeding the Doman Pinterest, we had a dog named Apollo, and Apollo had the ability to throw all the colors of a dominant pincher from bond to red to blue. Wasn't that Apollo? Yeah. Like, couldn't that same process work in pit bulls the same way, though? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it does. Breeding. Yeah. I think it does depend, you know, you could have a particular individual or, like I said, when you start putting these different bloodlines together that are different colors, any any one color could could come up or not, you know. Like I say, you breed two black dogs together and, and uh, you know, uh, you have a red one come out. But yeah, depending on the genetics of that particular dog, he could throw a black, all black dog. He could throw an all tan dog. He could throw an all red dog. He could throw a brindle dog. It's just, that's what's within him, you know. Okay. So it really does boil down to the traits. It does. It does. And and you have to know them. That's why I encourage people to study them. Study the history of your own dogs at least. And see what is written about them, said about them. See, you know, read their old matches and like that. So you'll have an understanding of what is possible in your own dogs. Because ultimately, that's what anybody's going to do. Even, even, you know, people ain't competitors no more. And you can't do that no more. It's illegal. All that. It doesn't matter. You're still going to follow or look or expect certain traits out of your dogs. That just Even just the way they're built, you know. They're going to be built a certain way. You're going to prefer one thing over another generally, you know. And you might even prefer certain colors over, you know. But if you're not if you're not judging your dogs based on performance, how do you know what it is? How do you know what it can do? You know, right. you don't even know if your dog has good air or bad air because you never condition them. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. He might get tired yeah, after true. ten minutes. He might have a big old long deep chest and have air for shit, and get tired after ten minutes. You won't know unless you put him on a you know some kind of program. You know. Yeah, because they're doing a lot of breeding, you know, today's dog, not, not based on performance. I think I, I noticed they're being bred on a lot of paper. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, Most they're matching up papers more than... Yeah. And I think know, that's, I, 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 you know, I think that's what, <laughs> what uh, why a lot of these, you know, I'm doing videos, you do videos, I have chats, different chats and, and posts and all this, you know, in my group and all that. Because we're seeing that happen a lot more. People are breeding based on paper, you know, on pedigrees. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, if you ask somebody, well, you know, like they'll show me a ped, you know, and I'll, I'll tell them, I don't, you know, I don't know, I'm not familiar with any dogs up close. What can you tell me about him? Well, I don't know. I just know he's Midnight Cowboy and he's, you know, Jeep and this and that. And I heard, you know, that's good blood. So they don't even know what's behind their own dogs themselves, you know. Or something they're going to go acquire. They know the bloodline. They've heard of it, you know. But they don't know what the particular dogs can do. They don't know if it's a, you know, a champion or a weight pool dog. Or, you know, if the dog is known for its strength or speed or anything. So you can't, there's, I can't really help people with that kind of question. Because I don't know. And they don't know. They can't tell me, you know. Right. Right. So that that's yeah, why absolutely. I think that's yeah, why we're yeah, yeah. we're having a lot of these chats, you know, because like what, you know? If, if someone if someone to come to me and go, "Hey, I want to you know, I want to learn to shoot firearms." I'll ask them, "Do you have you ever held a firearm? Do you have to know how to shoot and all that?" They go, "Nope, I've never touched one." I'd have to go back at least to some history of the firearm to explain to them how it works, how to load it, how to clean it, right? They'd have to know something about 
firearms, make sure you don't point this the wrong way or the wrong thing. Don't put your hand on the finger on the trigger, all this stuff, you know. So that just should be part and partial to anything that you're interested in. And unfortunately today a lot of people they they don't, you know, they they don't know very much about the breed itself or the particular dogs that they're working with, you know. Right. They're just basing everything on the pedigrees. Hmm. But that's a good point. That's a that's a good point because when I put them on that bus and come back back in my time, you know, it's it's a different conversation. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, my conversation is not the conversation they would have now. So by taking them back in my time, I discussed it wasn't papers. <clears throat> you know, papers could probably get you as far as I like the dog, so now I want to see what the papers look like. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Because yep. Then that becomes a factor. Okay, where did this dog get this trait? And you go looking for it. Right. Why is this dog this good? I go looking for the why. You know? But it still starts off with me having to like that dog. Yep. That, you know, that's what, that. Yep, that's what uh, that's what people should do. And see, when, when you, you know, I kind of do that. That's the way I write. You know, I kind of write like we're sitting there talking. So that anybody reading it can put their self in that place. Like they're there witnessing it or sitting around talking. Right. And when you go back on the bus, you know, that's what you're doing with your audience. You're taking them back to that time so that they're present at that time in their mind. Right. They got a mind's eye mm -hmm. view of what is going on uh, at the time, whether you're talking about a particular dog or a match, an old match or the traits of certain individuals, what you saw. Right, they they have to be able right. to look at it like, like they're it's in front of them, you know, and and like you know fighting style. Let's say you got a stifle dog. Well, you know how does he get back to the stifle? Does he lift the front leg and shoot for the back? Does he come around the side? You know, does he get in the stifle? Does he get in the kidneys? Does he does he uh, uh, fight foul? You know, so when we're explaining their this stuff, they can get a picture in their mind. Of what that dog is doing. Right. So when we talk about the structures. Or we talk about the behaviors. You know. The dog was intense. And the dog scream in the corner. Or the dog scratch hard. Or the dog scratch funny. Or he fought off his back. Or something like that. It's supposed to get. They're supposed to get a picture. Of that in their mind. As we're talking. And let's say it's something about structure. We talk about the structure of a dog back in the day. If their dogs are built that way, they can at least relate, you know. Hey, Bolio dogs are built this way. I got Bolio blood. My my dogs are following that pattern because they're built the way you're describing it to me from 40 years ago. Right. So that's where I see the benefit of, of talking about stuff in the past. You know, when you talk about the bus and, and talk about the people, you know, and the dogs, you know, what made them special. Right. You know, why, why did you like them? So that can be transferred forward. You know, I like these particular dogs or this bloodline for a particular reason. Because of this and that. Right. And I think that's what's being lost. Instead of the physical, mental, behavioral stuff that we concentrate on, they're looking at the breeding itself, the pedigree itself. Because, mm -hmm. uh, yep. you know, that's what I get. I got a Jeep, Red Boy, Bolio, Turtle Buster, you know, uh, Jocko, Kobe, Carver Dog. You know, and I'm going like, what the <laughs> hell is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it could be that, man, you know, all them dogs are related. Maybe the what he got, maybe they're all related. It just comes from that stuff, but there's, they don't know it themselves, so they can't explain it to me, you know? <laughs> they can't tell me, so how right. am I, you know? I mean, that, that really puts a, a shining light on, and I'm going to have Friday make sure everybody go back to this video as a continuing part two. You'll find part two 
over there on the professor's channel. There you go. So we can, you know what I mean? And because we got a lot of views picked up off of that. It was, you know, it's something interesting, especially for guys today on what they're trying to do today. You know, they talk like we act back then. But see, we was acting. Right. They're talking. And see, that's the difference. You know, you're talking, but a lot of what you're talking about was not talked it was not talked about. It was action. Right. You know, we we seen these bloodlines work. We we went after traits. You know, we're trying to add traits to what we what we got in our line. You know what I mean? Yep. They yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Like just putting that trait on the, the pedigree and not the dogs. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes so, you can tell by the the comments they make, you know, and uh, and uh, right. you know they, uh, you know they 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 don't have that that hands-on experience, you know. They're making a right. comment in such a way where you know they want to be part of the club or they want to be involved in the conversation, right? But they don't have the actual experience to to comment that way, you know. And uh, uh, you know, I can usually tell who has experience, you know, because a lot of times the you know, you'll say particular dogs, right? You'll mention dogs from the past and this and that. And some people will say, hey, you know, I've got him in my pedigree, you know. But right. for the most part, they don't even know the dog you're talking about. They never heard of him, you know. Or mm -hmm. someone like me, I've heard of just about every one you ever mentioned, you know. I know where they come from. I know all them guys you talk about or I know of them. I might not know them personally. I may have talked to him or I may have met him or been around him, you know, at pit side. I may have seen a match dog. But yeah. at least I that's the difference. I have that experience and a lot of the people today, even some that have had dogs for a long time, just they didn't they didn't get out there and do the thing, you know. They just they love the breed and all that, but they're not familiar with the particular dogs you're talking about. And uh you know that that's long past but you can still do some research on those dogs you know i mean right. I'm, I'm always willing that's why i like coming on your show you know we can talk about certain things and we can get ram on there talk about this dog that dog and and all that and it gives people uh you know two things it may be dogs we're talking about are in their dog's pet you know or it may be dogs that they heard about but didn't know much about and now we can give them some information you know and that's the thing about being right. being active. If you did it, then then you have that personal relationship, that personal experience, and you can spread it, right? You can give the, tell them the truth, right. basically. You know, like Ace. I knew about Ace way back then. I knew who he beat. I followed his career, this and that. But I like hearing it from you because you actually was there. That's the difference to me. You know. Right. Yeah, that's true. That is true. That's why I like taking them on that bus ride because if they step into our shoes, when they go home, they're going to feel, and hopefully they'll feel and see the difference, you know? Yep. Because the line needs to I me. Mean, I can only go on our path. So uh, our expectations is the same expectations that the guys in the 1920 when they were being allowed to do it, you know? Yeah. They had the same perception. You know, I go back that far because we watched the game grow from that. You know, all the way up into the 50s where the these guys were getting better and better, you know. And then to me, right around the middle of the 80s and to the 90s, we had a lot of very bad-ass dogs out there. You know, and, and that was like a, a eye opening to me because I seen all those old bloodlines being crossed and making great dogs. You know, it wasn't all about this Earl Tudor or, or Floyd Boudreaux and his line of dogs running. He, he, his line of dogs had Floyd Tudor, you know what I mean? They had the rundown. Yep. Zebo, Lonzo. 
petri like tornado. She got a whole bunch of that in her in her in her bottom. And then when you look back, there was definitely tornado was really a lion bear dog. Yep. Yeah, I'm glad you, you know, made and, that and, that point last night. That that was a good point because you talked about the evolution of the breed. You know how it was in the past, right. how it increased, how the dogs got better. And, and, you know, things have a way of coming around, you know, it, it, they repeat their self. Right. So in that period, say from the, the 80s, 90s, even up into the 2000s, people were just repeating the same pattern as what was done before. You have a bunch of dog guys that were competing and breeding their dogs together based on performance, just like they had done a hundred years before then. It's just that there's more dogs and more dog men, so there's more being done, right? Right. And then at some point, it started to slack off from that. Because of, you could say because of the laws or whatever, you know. But in certain countries, right. like right. where it's legal, they kind of kept that going. And and they even they're doing what was done in the past too, right? So take Mexico. The dogs were imported from the U.S., most of them, to Mexico. Well... Years later, they're importing dogs back to the yes, U.S. Sir. from Mexico, right? Good dogs. Yeah. Good dogs. Yeah, good dogs. Good dogs. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Now, in either yeah, in either true. scenario, the the foundation is the same. It's the same dogs, right? It's mm -hmm. just in the United States we did what we did with them. In Mexico, they did it their way, but the dogs are being now they're being crossed back and forth with each other. You know. Right. And, and that's part of the evolution. That's part of what happens. But that was a good point you made, starting from the past and how it moved forward and evolved. And then in that 80s, 90s, you know, you, you see that, that pattern being the same thing, you know. Competitive dogs breeding bred together. That's the foundation of the breed. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah, I hope I made you proud. <laughs> I know you, 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 you always do, show. brother. You I'll always, be the professor. Yeah. I don't know what to tell y'all. Yeah, yeah. You always do, brother. With that, the time's kind of running out, but you know, we're gonna do this again. In fact, I'm gonna next time I see something that I don't get to be on the show, I'm gonna call you up and say, Hey, let's do a show like that. And we'll back and forth. I'll share your stuff. Yeah, uh somebody shared the the, the video on my uh on my group. He asked me first. You know, hey, can I share the mm -hmm. going hard count? I say, yeah, share anything you want, man. Put all, I don't care. You put all of them on there, you know, because it, it helps. It helps both of us. You know, you help me. I help right. you. That's the kind of people we are. And that's how the community should be. And I don't have no ego. I'm going to steal from you. You borrow from me. I don't care. Just so we get the message across. That's the thing, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm calling for you the whole time. Mike apologized. Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Next day, just text me or call me. I'll use that as an excuse to get away from the family. I got to go do this, you know. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I went on what I knew. Yeah. No, you right. did good. I was hoping I would get it right. Yeah, you did good because, you know, uh, you, you know, you have, you have the experience of your past. So you can put right. that forward. You, you know, you know how to read a pedigree. So even though maybe you didn't know before, as you're putting these peds up and you're looking at them and you're going, well, shit, there's a pattern here. Wait, there's some yeah. commonality here. So even yeah. whether it was in real time, live or whatever you want to say, you figured it out right there in front of the, in, you know, in front of the chat and, and every, whoever's watching. You did it yourself, whether you realize you were doing it or not. Well, right. <clears throat> you know, just, just by looking at the pet, just by going, you go, oh, wait a minute. These dogs are related. Wait, this is a cross that's been made before. I see this or that, you know. And that's what I'm saying why a lot of people say the stuff is scatterbred because up close, you know, I'm like you. I don't know the dogs up close. So I have to go back, you know. I used to read the pedigrees mm -hmm. from left to right because I knew the dogs. Now I don't know the dogs. I'm not familiar with them no more. So I have to read them from right to left, go back in the past and then come forward and see what mm -hmm. patterns they're using, line breeding or relatives or however they're doing it, crosses here and there, bud lines being put together. And then that's how I determine whether it's scatterbred or not. 
you know. And if it's all right. every which way, and and no matter how far back I go, it's a bunch of freaking crosses. Yeah, that's scatterbred. But yes. <clears throat> you know, when you see patterns, or you see some the dog, same dog here and there throughout the pedigree, that's not scatterbreeding. Right. Now I seen back in the day, I seen Bolio, I seen uh, Eli, and Bolio, Eli, and Yellow Cross. I said these are the same kind of dogs that created Mady in them, yo. Yep. We're way back here. Yeah. They doing it way back there. Yep. And we talking like that was something new now. Right. Right. You know, but yep. no, it wasn't new because we we're seeing it way back here. Way back. And and uh, they were making those kind of crosses. Yeah, but I, and I, I was surprised on that too because by my searching, I was running into it. Exactly. It's like, I can't believe they were being never gone back. I mean, they had the whole little get up like these are crosses. The names we're not looking at the names. We're looking at the line, the breeds. Right. And these are the same type of dogs that created May Day. Yep. And, and that's what, you know, I, I mentioned this too. That's what I mean when I say uh, people, even if they don't know how dogs were bred in the past or they didn't know which bloodline was put together, when they start breeding dogs in the present time and they figure out which ones work, it's going to be the same patterns they were using in the past. That's why I always say, oh, it's it's a English-Irish cross. You know, it's Kobe Diabo, like that. Because by virtue of those being the most successful breedings made, even if someone breeding today doesn't know all that information from the past, when they put it together, they're going to find the best breedings that they make are the ones that were done in the past. If if you can understand, if I'm making myself clear, you know, they, it's going to work because it's worked before. Whether, right. whether, you, whether you know it or not, or know the bloodlines from the past, 100 years ago, or whatever, it's going to work, because it's worked before, and that those have proven to be the best ones. So that happens a lot, like you're saying. I even do that, and I oh, yeah, okay, they were doing that back then. Oh, okay, I see. And, and it's just a, you know, repetitive thing that keeps popping up every, you know, so many generations. Right. Yep. All right, brothers. Well, I'm getting close to time here. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll I'll keep you in mind, and and uh, we're gonna do this again. We'll, we'll, we'll that way we can get some cross reference and you know share each other's stuff and and get the message out to more people. That's true. Any time, big bro. Any time. I appreciate you know I mean? it. I'm putting that pedigree. I go searching. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I like to go searching. Yeah. Get yeah. Them a, yeah. A, a, you know, visual aids. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I, I felt I felt a little naked last night because you, I, I, I there were just several times that yeah. I was like, you know, when the professor put it out there, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. It wasn't easy for me. I can't even help y'all tonight. I can just go on what I know. Right. Because I don't understand the scatterbread. See, schoolboy has to teach me that part because yeah. what y'all call the scatterbread, I don't see scatterbread. I see formulas in these dogs. There it is. It's that you simple. So, yep. You did good. You did good. I like I said, I I, I went back afterwards and, and you know I, I, I kept some stuff in my mind, you know, so we could bring it up today. But no, you did good. The thing is you're honest, you know. If you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, you don't know it. But you came to the realization that, hey, these people are calling this stuff scatterbred. And from your research, just looking at the pedigrees you're looking at, it ain't. And you were right. They weren't. I was seeing the same thing you was. So if that means anything, you know, you were spot on. Yeah, it means a lot to me. Cause I was, I, I, I was hoping you were going to agree because <laughs> I did not know. Because what they were calling scatterbred, I didn't see it. I didn't see. I thought yeah. Scatterbred was no, just you was a right. bunch of outcross, 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 outcross. Yep. But these were outcross. So I, I seen formulas now, and that was the point because I really don't know exactly. And I think you explained it very well what Scatterbred is. A lot of guys really just don't know the true definition as far as in our time. Yep. Not their time, because I don't understand their time. I'm not in their time, so I don't understand their time. But let me take you back in our time. 
and explain to you, you know, what you're calling scattered bread is not scattered bread. You know, just based on these things, you breed for traits back then. You weren't feeding papers. Yeah, you're right. So, you're right. You did a great job. Uh, once again, thanks everybody for listening. I'd like to thank the twins, Mo and Mike, for coming on the show, and we're going to do it again. So feel free to comment. Classroom with the professor, y'all. Yeah. Classroom with the professor. Anytime. Thank you, brother. Anytime. Thank you.